Welcome back. Returning to the panel, we have host of Young Heretics podcast, Spencer Clavin. Also joining us is host of Slightly Offensive, Eliza Schaefer. And last but certainly not least, we have host of Heck Off, Kami John Doyle. Okay. Those last names were okay, but sometimes I get some really trippy ones. I'm very, very self-conscious about saying last names. I just wanted to share that with my audiences. <laughs> All right, first up in the category of politics. Let's see what we have. All right, so last week I had said that pedophilia is around the corner. It's pretty obvious if you're paying any attention at all that they're going to start saying, okay, like, you know, pedophilia, it's not really that bad. Um, that seems obvious to me. I, of course, got attacked by Media Matters because they love the show. Hello, Media Matters. It's me. <laughs> the um, PR department. Standing by it, the slippery slope is real. Let's watch this montage of where we're at, I guess, in society of identifying. <laughs> Toy self. She's a toy. She's a toy. Those are her main pronouns. Thank you for respecting her identity. She's a fish. Fishes, which is, you can't really say. Fish self. This is real. It's not a joke. And y'all thought me uh, teaching the children about me being Polly was crazy. But not only that, but they also know that I'm gender fluid. When I also explain to them that I'm pagan, so I am also a witch. I don't know who needs to hear this, but top surgery is for anybody. Whoa. There's no template for what you must look like after top surgery. What makes life so beautiful is the diversity in its people. Non-binary humans exist, and we legally are acknowledged now. I have an X on my license, so calling me a woman is discrimination. Girl, calling you stable would be discrimination. <laughs> <laughs> Uh -huh. Take it away, gentlemen. What are we looking at here? Like, there's no standard for what these bodies have to look like. That much is very clear. Like, yeah. you've made clear that there is no standard. Of, no, I mean, it is, it's, it, it's always very sad to me to watch these mostly children or the adults who are, you know, bringing these children in. What you're observing is a theology. It's a cult. This is a religion. And th there are religious convictions associated with it. You know, I mean, this is essentially a state-established religion. And there's no limiting principle. To it. it, it's it's simply a kind of just you know break down all the walls and the, and, and the, you know they get these kids on as you said in your monologue, Candice, they become perma clients of big pharma. I mean that's really who's benefiting here, right? Who's to whose good is this? It's not to the kids, right? These kids that have been you know so terribly uh, desensitized and and just you know it, it makes them essentially into victims of of the state. Right. Yeah, I think that the only uh, justification God needs to condemn the world is the existence of TikTok. Uh, <laughs> genuinely speaking, Agreed. spend a little bit of time on there and you're like, God, end the world now. Yeah, right, right. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a, a little late, actually. But, but when you look at this, I mean, I paid $35 in the state of California to become non-binary. So I kind of demand respect a little bit. I got a gender X on my ID. Wow. Uh, I revoked my manhood. And I knew that it was all BS when I stood there with my wife looking at the lady and she goes, so you're not a man. I went, I'm an ex. Ask the wife, <laughs> I'm an ex. And that's an what ex. it is, it's, it's all made up in their heads. They wanna feel special. And quite frankly, like that uh, Shrek Fiona looking girl in the, in the second video with the green hair. Yeah. I mean, they, they intentionally try to look ugly and it's just not gonna fly because in the end, God didn't create us to look like this. He didn't create us to act like this. And these people are absolutely insane. And I'm just saying this is state sponsored. This is socially sponsored, mm -hmm. tech sponsored mental illness. It is 100%. It's funny too, because you can tell just how starved the younger generations are of having a sense of identity. Like they really want this attention drawn to themselves because every other generation probably in human history could have an identity, whether it's a religious identity cultural identity. All of our identities have been purposefully eroded through public education after World War II because they thought that they could like literally take everything that a man would have to stand up for away from them so as to prevent World War III. This was written about in the authoritarian personality. And so now the only gen um, identities that you're allowed to have in this generation are those that are basically state adjacent. So you can have an identity in the victim hierarchy as like a member of the LGBT community or as a minority, but you're not allowed to say you're a Christian, an American or anything like that that would actually compel someone to want to stand up for something good. Yeah, I actually wrote in my book, I have this whole theory that what's actually happening is this thing that I call over-civilization, which is like, it's natural for humans to want to strive towards something, right? Towards, towards some goal. Like, you want to be like, we're the generation that ended this, you know, segregation. We're the generation that ended this. And unfortunately, when you arrive at a society where all the problems have basically been mm. solved and people are privileged and actually, by and large, over-privileged, they still have this, like, yearning to achieve something. Mm. So they arrive at, like, over-civilization, which is like, you're, you're, you get back to the beginning on a lot of these topics. 
and you get back to just blatant foolishness, right? So it's like, we've got everything we've wanted, so let's just make up stuff. Oh, oh, have they already, they've given us gay marriage? Okay, okay, so let's uh, now say that we need trans fish shelves to fish shelves, is that what she said? <laughs> you know, to be able to marry Wiccan, what, pagan, what, I mean, like, it, it gets nuts because they want to feel like they've done something. And at the end of the day, these people are just losers. And if I walk into a classroom and saw any of that, <laughs> trying to teach my kid, I, my child would be unenrolled. Yeah, I mean, they call, this, uh, they call this St. George in retirement syndrome, right? St. George slays the dragon, but then what does St. George do? Because he's the dragon slayer. So he just has to wave his sword around at thin air, essentially. Right. And you see this on college campuses all the time. People, as you say, need something to strive for. But you're, you're exactly right that the ex excesses of nationalism during the 20th century essentially led us to this idolatrous... It was, uh, nationalism was, is what caused these problems, the excesses of nationalism. And therefore, we must... It, erase from human life any kind of patriotic sentiment, any sort of devotion to a higher cause or higher ideal. And guess what? <laughs> that is also an evil, right? I mean, we see that when you, you sort of veer off into this other mode of evil, you say never again, as if it means that you can just freeze humanity, you know, in, in this kind of perfect amber, and there'll never be any problems or excesses. There are real challenges facing us. I mean, this is the tragedy, is that, of course, you know, space travel, um, the, the collapse of the dollar, the, I mean, any number of actual serious issues that these kids could be dealing with. They could be going to school and learning, like, you know, how to make a machine or how to sign a check, at least, you know. And, and in fact, they're being indoctrinated and, you know, really, you know, invited into this this religious cult, so that all of their energy, their passion can be fomented in these crazy, made-up, invented crises. And as we're seeing, like, you know, once you do that long enough, you actually do have a crisis on your hands. It's the exactly crisis of right. pup self and demon self. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, it's speaking of cults, the new media cult is the President Zelensky cult. I am not a member of it, obviously. I, you know, I love Daily Wire because they allow me to hold my own perspectives. And from the very beginning, I was like, this is just a little shady. I just, you know, when we go from this, you just enshrine people at all times. I, I mean, I'm not going to give a Hey Arnold reference, people that watched it growing up. But you know, like Helga in her closet used to have the enshrined Arnold head. This is what happens in the media. They're just like, George Floyd. And everyone's like, woo! I love him. He's amazing. He's the most amazing person ever. I don't care about his record. Dr. Fauci, woo, vote for Fauci. He's not even running for anything, you know? And then now we've got the Zelensky thing and this phenomenon. I've been like, guys, there's a lot happening here. Like, and, and he's being weird. I just find the stuff that he is prioritizing as someone that is in war to be weird. And so last week we covered his Grammys appearance. I just don't think that if your city is under fire, you should prioritize time to make a Grammys video. But let's, now he has, his wife has done an interview with Vogue. Um, and so Ukraine's first lady, Olina Zelenska, on life under siege and how her country is moving forward. And then on top of this, he has made time to do a photo shoot and um, an interview with 60 Minutes in his bunker. I, let's just show some of it, I guess. I don't know. We met President Zelensky in the blacked out hallways of his command he looks center well in Ukraine's to me, capital. He looks styled he, to me, to be honest. It is a fortress crowded with troops, machine guns, mines, explosives, and a great deal more. Are you safe here? Yeah, I'm fine, he told us. I feel pretty calm about it. Our guards are worried because there could be an airstrike. But when we get the air raid evacuation signal, we head downstairs. So they decided to, on this staircase on the right, do a photo shoot. I think we have some photos from it that he did at. Like, I just, I, I, I personally can't take this seriously. Like, I just, I, I literally can't. I can't take this seriously. I just, I don't know. I just don't imagine Winston Churchill, like, you know, Dunkirk, and then he's, like, doing these poses. It just doesn't seem, it doesn't seem real to me. And the fact that he happens to be an actor, actually, doesn't help. So I just want everybody's perspective on the panel. Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> very well. That's why we're here. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I, I have a slightly different, you know, attitude toward this guy. It really, to me, it is actually not about Zelensky himself or Ukraine itself. I, ad I admire Zelensky. I don't know what I would do in his situation. I mean, this is what Trump said. Like, if I were tested in this way, I, I, I don't know what I would do. I know what I wouldn't do. Well, okay. But so this is the thing, right, is that, and actually, if I were in his position, I probably would try to leverage social media for, to get 
the U.S. to get, you know, powerful Western allies into the war. None of that means that we ought to be, like, hero-worshipping this man. I mean, the thing where our, our press and our media, who are always, in my view, the villains of the story, mm. have turned this person into the next object of ritual worship. Because you're absolutely right, we're looking, we're all hungry in this nation for God, they've taken God away, and so now we're all seeking for the next person to worship. And yeah, I mean, like, this is something that, if I were the president of a, of a country that were <laughs> under a, assault from a nuclear power, um, I would be trying everything in my arsenal to, to, to tug the heart strings of Westerners. But that doesn't mean that we ought to be like just so head over heels for this obvious propaganda. What do you think? Yeah, well, okay. Number one, his only crime from showing up at the Grammys was he got the wrong award show. He's an actor. He should have been at the Academy Awards. Uh, possibly, you know, could have saved Will Smith <laughs> some trouble there. Uh, <laughs> I'm serious, though. But when you look at this, I mean, kudos to you, man. I mean, you got a better profile picture than I do. And that says something about me because I work in social media. So you got a better team than I do. But Not. But I mean, I mean, thinking about this, I mean, this is not the first time the U.S. has weaponized social media for a revolution inside of Ukraine. Specifically, we're talking from 2004 to 2014. Absolutely. We have been doing this, and I knew this was going to be a problem because, number one, anyone back to TikTok who was using TikTok to fight a war, you know they're on the wrong side of history. Mm -hmm. And TikTok immediately started pushing everything that is pro-Ukraine. And what's crazy is they're allowing Russians that are anti-Russia to skirt the bans to, to make propaganda against Russia. So when you have this bias, you go to Instagram, there's the Ukrainian heart in Texas. Tony, yeah, it's like te Black Lives Matter all over exactly. again. Exactly, in Texas, American flags, I see more Ukrainian flags flying than American flags in the heartland of Texas. And you look at this and you go, man, if you can go into a liberal or progressive neighborhood, what did we see? There is no hate here, we believe in science. Then it was like, we know, again, Dr. Fauci and get your shots. And now it's Ukraine. There's nothing but to believe this is another psyop by the American media to push a propaganda message that, quite frankly, I stopped believing back in 2020 when they were burning down cities for black lives. So. I, I honestly, I totally agree. Yeah, and, and to that point, it's funny to look at this and you see what is so obviously just the, the manufacturing of wartime propaganda. We look at this on the panel and we're just like, come on, you really think we're going to buy this? And then you log online and you see everyone's <laughs> buying this. And of course, these people are so hysterical because like Black Lives Matter, like COVID, they can only argue from emotion because they were only convinced by emotion, by wartime propaganda or any other sort of propaganda. And that's why, of course, there's no like factual argument for like why all of a sudden they want us to be involved in Ukraine. And an honest person would ask themselves, like if we can agree that this consensus has been manufactured, uh, why they didn't care about the drug cartel wars in Mexico, which have killed 375,000 people, or even the the Civil war in the Congo, which has killed five and a half million people. Like this is objectively less brutal. It's costing less lives, and we have no geopolitical interest in Ukraine, just as we did in these other countries. So an honest person would ask themselves, why all of a sudden does the media want me to care about this conflict in particular? But no one's asking themselves that question. Right, and I've been asking that question from the beginning. And obviously, when you dig, you you really find out that actually that this does have geopolitical interest. It's just not for Americans and That's not for true. the American people, but the Biden family absolutely, <laughs> and these corrupt families that have been laundering money in that region forever. And it's it's should be okay for us to talk about those issues without being painted as a Putin puppet, which is their game, right? You don't support Black Lives Matter, then you're a white supremacist. You don't support uh, this show, which to me, as you said, like, I don't know what I would do if I was leading the country, but I know what the hell I would not be doing. And if I got an email when I'm telling you every single day I'm facing assassination attacks, every, I mean, literally, he's telling us he's like the new Batman, right? Every single day they're, I'm facing assassination attacks, they're, they're, they're storming here, they're bombing here, I'm in Kiev, I'm in the middle of it. If I got an email from Anna Wintour during that time, I would be like, could you kindly F off? Like, this is a real life circumstance. If I got an email from the Met Gala, like, it's like, it's insulting. I would be insulted. And I think that if I was a Ukrainian individual and I was seeing this, I would be insulted. I would say, really? Like, we have people that are not able to eat. Their houses have been destroyed. And you're making time to make appearances, appearances at the Grammys. Like, I mean, this is, that's an award for singers. And by the way, it's not exactly pulling at the heartstrings of Americans because we've been done with the Hollywood elites for quite some time. Perhaps, except... <laughs> I mean, I would like to believe that, right? I would be, I, I would be optimistic to suggest that, you know, that real Americans don't buy this stuff. But as John is suggesting, a lot of people do. And in my view, I mean, it really is, it does come down to our need for ritual, our need for religion, our need for God. I mean, you see that, that meme, I, believe, I support the current thing, and he's got the Ukraine flag, and he's got the COVID <laughs> shot, and he's got the, you know, all these. And it's like, you know, what it really is, is I worship the current God. I mean, it's like people are so starved for a sense that there is something higher than themselves. Pagans. Which they can, 
Well, right. And so, yeah, I mean, again, we can disagree about, you know, what the, what Zelensky's strategy might be, but it's really, it's, it's, it's a very little concern to me because I want to know what America ought to be doing. And it sure as hell ain't establishing a no-fly zone over Ukraine, which is what they're asking for. I mean, Zelensky I think, gives me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> and that's an old school 90s term, but there's just something about him that I, I just do not trust, you know? And everyone's like, why don't you talk about Putin? I'm like, because the we're not putting Putin on a pedestal. Everyone's acknowledging that right. he's evil and he shouldn't have done this. So we don't, I don't need to sit here and make an argument against Putin when we all already know what's been going on in Russia, that he wants to be the dictator of Russia for 300 years. This Zelensky pedestal thing is making me very uncomfortable. And I think that the truth will eventually, like, I'm going to be basically being like, told you so, because you know me, I'm not humble. I'm going to say, I told you so when the time comes. So keep watching, Media Matters. <laughs> Moving on, because this is amazing, you guys. You know it's Lent. And I knew that my husband is extremely, extremely Catholic. Um, and I just did not know that this was an option. And I'm very excited. Um, a church in suburban Chicago has said it's fasting from whiteness, guys. I didn't know this was an option. This is not a joke. And here is a clip of them announcing what they have decided to abstain from being white. <laughs> The Christian season of Lent is coming to a close as a leader of this Oak Park Church speaks out for the first time over the church's so chosen Lenten fast. <laughs> for us, it. Lent is all about loving more people. Reverend John Edgerton people. said it was love that inspired a church sign headline, Look Fasting this. from Whiteness. <laughs> he said the meaning behind the boldness, celebrating diversity. Lent is a time when we reprioritize we love the racial and economic diversity, the bringing together of people who are not the same. The sacrifice moving from a traditional Lenten celebration to exclusively showcasing voices and music of black, indigenous, and other people of color. I just love this story. I'm sorry. I think it's so <laughs> funny. We're just, we're so crazy. This is just, this is the craziest headline oh. I've ever seen. I'm like, so, or have you guys given up your whiteness for Lent? Is my question. Yeah, I'm not doing that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, genuinely speaking, when you when you hear this, it reminds me of a of a time, uh, you know, during uh, 2020 during the riots. I remember there was a car lot on fire in Kenosha, Wisconsin. I mean, with flames that literally reminded me of the end times. I mean, millions of dollars of damage. I remember watching a sign go up in flames of a church that had a, you know, it was burning and it said Black Lives Matter on it. And to this day, I went back a few months ago to Kenosha where uh, the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, shootings took place. That church still has a Black Lives Matter sign in the window. What's crazy is the side of the church next to the car lot that was on fire is still has the black soot of the flames of the, you know, people, the, the, the evangelists and the missionaries and the diversity that they were representing. And I just think when you look at this, when you see this, and you ask yourself, I mean, this is not Christianity. This is Satanism. These are satanic Absolutely. priests that are coming out to demonize anybody for the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. Tell anybody in this country that you need to try to, to give up how God made you, who God designed you to be, mm -hmm. in order to get closer to God. Not only is that disrespectful, but it's an abomination. It is. And if anyone's fallen for this trap, I mean, by now, you have no excuse. Right. I actually totally agree with that. So you walk into your church and they tell you, hey, it's Lent. We're going to ask everybody to abstain from whiteness. What do you do? Yeah, As I'm walking to my church in Chicago, <laughs> yeah. I'm stumbling by heroin needles and homeless people and, and blood residue and fecal matter. And the pastor looks at me and he's like, we need less whiteness. I'm like, you know what? I could not. I actually thought on the way here that if we just had less cargo shorts and country music, <laughs> none of these problems would be. That is so true. But it's, it is so true. But it's just bad. It's a way to redirect because everybody, you know, always says, oh, well, this, this world's going to hell in a handcart. No one ever really thinks about why. It's just kind of this vague thing that we all know is true, which is why slogans like Make America Great Again are just so great. And so they can kind of take that ominous idea that we all share and redirect it in a way that's advantageous to their politics with like, everyone knows it's bad. Well, have you considered this because of those, those white people that are kind of goofy, but other than that, we're pretty unproblematic in my opinion. Right. <laughs> it's just a little goofy, you know, it's kind of weird sometimes, but yeah, I think. <laughs> well, World War One, World War Two, a few things, but well, I mean, overall. Was... <laughs> well, there is a sense in which this is like weirdly Lenten because you look at the video of all these people, 
what color are their faces? <laughs> I mean, it's always white people. You always, any article you read, like, we need to talk about the white people problem. Yeah. Or, like, white people are the issue. Explain what, like, look it's at the, oh, look at the author bio. It's yeah. always a white it's person. It's white on white crime. Exactly. It's, pink it's self hate, right, exactly. It's self-loathing. I mean, Nietzsche called this out, like, you know, over a hundred years ago, that when, when you es essentially make your religion into nothing, but it's like self-loathing and victimization, then you just have to find more and more rituals of, of mm. you know, of self-flagellation. Self yeah, exactly. And, and this is, so in that sense, it's weirdly lent in that it's an act of like complete self-subjugation. But of course, as you say, there's nothing more contrary to the gospel than the idea that some essential, you know, in ineradicable but non-essential aspect of your personhood makes you uniquely flawed and sinful in the eyes of God. I mean, it is, it, it, in the end, of course, it does make one weep if, uh, as well as laugh that they would say these things to people. And these were the same people that we saw during the George Floyd riots that were bending down to black people when they saw them. Remember, there were people that were shining the shoes of black people. I remember- Bowing bowing down, shining the shoes, and it wasn't like taking a knee in solidarity. I'm talking about like they were saying, I'm sorry, and getting on their knees in parks. And I remember watching that and being like, this is actually insane. And I think the most insane element of it is that I could never picture this reverse. Like this is actually something that black people would never do. Like this is just, <laughs> it's just not culturally, we have a few differences and this is one of them. Like there's <laughs> nothing you can say on a platform that's gonna get black people to agree to a week of like anti-blackness or like getting on your knees in front of any race of people and saying like, oh, even if it was Africans, like indigenous Africans, like, if, you know, you found a tribe, they would be like, absolutely not. This is weird. And for some reason, this, like, this point gets arrived too often whenever you're paying attention, like you said, to like white headlines, like the self-flagellation. I'm like, what are you guys doing? And I just kind of sit back and watch it. Like, I'm just sort of like, this is this is getting increasingly weird, man. Like, you guys you guys got to stop doing this. I do, I do think it's weird in a culture that we can't define what a woman is, but we can define what whiteness is. Shows you that we're not a, a culture of truth, but a culture of targeting people in order to make them not only victims, but aggressors and to attack the things that quite frankly, have built or strengthened this country. And, and to look at something like whiteness and to look at it holistically and tell it to the entire country, you know, this is something that we need to get rid of, is alienating and isolating the majority of people in this nation. You know, it's a divisive message. And besides the spiritual implications, I mean, who's come to kill, still, and destroy? Who's come to conquer? And not only is it the enemy, it is the father of lies, but also we have to realize this is an enemy from within. Any message in this country that is trying to get the people in this land to be divided on things and factors in our bodies and our lives that we cannot change, that is our number one enemy. And so they say whiteness is our enemy. I would say that those so-called priests, those are our enemies. I actually totally agree. And also, just as a point, that is the easiest way if you're ever debating a trans person to watch their whole arguments fall apart. I say, okay, can, can I be white and can you be black? And they go, <laughs> instantly, because it's like they won't go there, right? They cannot at all say that a black, like a white person can be black. And so they, they can be a fish, but you can't be black, right? It doesn't make any sense. And they, nev they can never, ever, ever defeat that argument or that point. All right, guys, next up is the category of pop culture. And get ready, because it's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, Lizzo, she's the rapper uh, who she likes to be naked because that's what we do, I guess, as rappers these days. <laughs> we're just naked all the time. And Lizzo, um, is, she's, a cult she's, a, she's a warrior um, for climate change. She really does not like, like climate change at all. So we're going to watch her give a speech, and then we're going to watch her board a private plane. <laughs> <laughs> this is Lizzo giving a speech about climate change. As we talk about climate change and making the world a better place, in solving homelessness, we also have to talk about the institutionalized racism that happens in this country all the time. And if we don't talk about our history constructively, how can we build a better future? <laughs> <laughs> Hippopotamus. <laughs> Woo! Guys, I am banning all jokes about farting cows. <laughs> I was gonna say that, that was like my first impulse. she's advocating against climate change, but like I mean, <laughs> think about it, she's I wasn't gonna go that far, but she's walking. I mean, the big gal, those are heavy breaths she's taking. What? Like, I felt that. I literally felt it. She started walking and we started shaking. Like, and I was like, whoa. We gotta talk guys, about she's one of the proud fat people, so she oh, that's why she's always naked. You guys need to get woke. Seriously. It's okay to be fat now. Fat is beautiful. Fat is healthy, actually, was the cover of a magazine recently. Mm -hmm. Like 
fat is healthy. So I don't know why you guys are being bigoted. Because <laughs> you guys did not rinse off your whiteness during Lent. It's too early for this, Candace. <laughs> I was having a good day. Wake up, everybody, with those boarding a jet. But I mean, just oh, the remarkable man. hypocrisy of this. Like, barring just the image, which will be left in all of your heads. I'm sorry, Ugh. audience. Um, it's like, what, what is this? What is this? Cellulite commercial? I, I, I mean, I'm like, not... it's hard. It, it's, it is, it's so disgusting. And here's the thing. If you're a huge fan of Lizzo and you love Lizzo, great. Her music's fun. It's catchy. I like Lizzo's songs too. Right. But if you want her to be around, like you have to acknowledge that she's killing herself, right? This is, we are watching a woman that is, it is slowly killing herself. Like you cannot be this size. I don't care how fun or poppy or how much you say you love your curves or how many calories you eat a day. The number one killer in, in this country remains um, clinic, clinical obesity, you know, heart disease that is inspired by clinical obesity. And that's not going to change. And for whatever reason, we've accepted this narrative that like, Fat is beautiful, you know what I mean? It's 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 bad. It's it's really bad. Well, it's daring you to notice and object, right? And yeah. this is a governing theme of really all ruling class politics. They'll tell you one thing and then they'll switch up their narrative and then they'll dare you to to, to notice, right? You know, oh, there's never there's never going to be a vaccine mandate. No, no, I would never mandate vaccines. Oh, today in fact, we're announcing that we're, you know, weaponizing OSHA to to reach into your workplace and try to make the, make you get the shot in your arm. And if you say that they, you know, that they maybe were planning this all along, you're a conspiracy theorist. You're a domestic terrorist. And similarly, right, this fat, you know, celebration stuff, it's just like daring you to acknowledge that there is such a thing as beauty. Because what they really want you to stamp out is any idea that there might be such a thing as natural virtue and excellence. And, and in order to do that, they just have to show you the ugliest thing they can possibly show you and insist that you call it beautiful. Deny right. so they the can take the right. clip and go, oh my God, Candace's panel said that Lizzo wasn't beautiful. It's right. like, yeah, water's wet. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, yeah, you yeah. know, and she might be a good person, but we're not going to pretend that that is objective objectively healthy or objectively beautiful, but the left does not understand objectivity. They want to erase objectivity. No, I know. And they talk about institutional racism. I mean, this is institutional obesification. I don't even know if that's a word. It is like, now. We are making it up. I don't know who's <laughs> watching, but hello. Uh, we get to redefine our own words today. I mean, they talk about, you know, curvy women are beautiful. Yeah, you're not supposed to have your own gravitational pull. I, <laughs> I saw moons orbiting the planet. I, I'm, I'm just sitting here going, there is a difference between having high cholesterol and being cholesterol. And so <laughs> when, when, when you look at that picture, I mean, I don't want to, you know, go out and people say fat shaming. Yeah, going out to someone who's struggling with their weight, I'm not going to walk around right. and be like, hey, fatty McFatty. I, you know, but with this, when you, when you come out. It. Yeah, but when you come out and you literally tell me, you know, this is health, this is good, you are an open target. This is the key thing. You are a fair an easy, very large target, so right. be careful, um, because we're coming for you. And the interesting thing about this is the institutionalized racism really is, again, I'd say institutional sexism, telling girls, specifically, not men, that not only being fat is good, but it's beautiful, and as I'm finding recently, that you're born fat, that you, some people just can't lose weight, and this constant lie that is actually wiping out our women, shortening their lives, and ultimately is part of the population control agenda, as we're seeing with people, you know, trying with euthanasia, with the abortion plan, and also, too, with while you're living here, make you miserable, fat, ugly, disgusting, and, of course, dying an early death. And I got to say this, she's being duped, she's a pawn, and sadly, people are falling for it. Right, right. It's such a display of pride, too. And the responses to the criticisms of this were so silly. Like, people were saying, oh, I don't know if we should be putting this in people's faces. Oh, well, you're just mad because she's getting on a private jet. And it's like, maybe, but I flew commercial yesterday. I mean, you got this much room on a seat, right? Right. So I don't know if it was by necessity. Yeah, I'd be mad if I was flying with her on a plane. Yeah, if you were just trying to, like, flex. But it's exactly as Spencer pointed out. I mean, we forget that leftism, in, in essence, is just a rejection of what is natural. And they reject hierarchy, which implies that there is objective beauty and objective... Uh, not beauty, and she would be an example of probably the latter category. And this is why, you know, all of these people that you see in the Antifa mug shots are all very dysgenic, they're very ugly people. And it's like they're competing against the idea of competition, whether that's with aesthetics or even in like a, merit a meritocracy system with like capitalism or something like that. That's literally what it is. And it always has been just miserable people who are mad at people who are better than them and trying to just tear the whole system down because they can't compete in it. Right, exactly. And, and I, I really do hope that she understands like, you know, we make fun of it because you are a target, as you said, like if you're coming out and you're you're saying that this is healthy and this is beautiful. Like you're, you're a liar, and we need to address liars. This is a lie in society among many of them. Um, I do want to get to this last video while we have time. It's just in our category of, wait, what am I even listening to? <laughs> Speaking of mental disorders, <laughs> Jesse Smollett. I don't, he can't stop. He just can't stop. Like so, he's out of prison. I don't even know if we can even count him as ever have being in prison. 
uh, but he's dropped a single, guys, and you have to listen to it. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I hate me too. They help me. You're not solving a crime. Taking out yes. the elements Woo. of race and trans and homophobia yeah. that's straight taking lives. Woo. But turn around and act like yeah. I'm the one that killed the strides. Yeah. Maybe we stick together. Maybe we, Maybe stick we together. read more. more. Instead of saying it's above Bug me, me now. now. Brother, yeah. you sure? Brother, you sure? I can't be mad. Can't be mad. Take my ego out. Take my ego out. So people searching for Okay, fame. I can't take it anymore. You gotta stop. Okay, okay. So basically, <laughs> this song is all about how it, it really isn't his fault, actually. And why would he do something so stupid? It's actually your fault because you didn't fast during Lent on your whiteness. So <laughs> who's downloading Jesse's new song? Well, speaking as a self <laughs> <laughs> speaking as a self-identified nerd, right? Somebody who respects his nerd identity. Like, what a nerd. What an enormous dork. Like, <laughs> maybe, maybe we read more. Like, isn't this supposed to be a rap song? Like, are we shouldn't we be talking about like, I don't know, having sex and shooting people up or something? But I, like it's just it, but there is something incredibly like lame about this woke social justice attitude. Like there's a real substitute teacher vibe to it of just like, you know, you gotta, you ought to be reading more. You need to be doing the work. Like it's not my fault is that you're, you haven't like, you know, downloaded enough Kindle versions of white fragility or whatever. Right, uh, yeah. But like the thing to me though, is that like, I genuinely believe like Jesse Smollett, if he's out on anything, it should be insanity because I, I really do believe he is mentally ill. Like I, I, if I was actually like on jury of his peers, I would look at this person and see everything he's done from screaming out into the courtroom saying, I'm not suicidal. Like this is not a person that is, that is mentally stable, that is mentally well. He should have never been given the platform in the first place. Like he's missing a chip is the only way I can describe it. You see it in his eyes. He's constantly acting. He's never like, who is Jesse Smollett? Well, the world may never know. No, and I'm just trying to think how the live performance of this would go. Like <laughs> you're on the piano, you know, it's a, it's like a uh, acoustic set and it goes, Hey everybody, so uh, this next one, I wrote this song after uh, faking a hate crime in Chicago and I <laughs> just got out of prison due to uh, institutionalized corruption and uh, this one's for all my transphobes, homophobes, and my illiterates. Yeah. It's like, I mean, <laughs> what's going on? Where's the market? And there's no market yeah. for this stuff. But of course, we're talking about it, we're mocking it, and I don't think anybody is really like is really here for this kind of stuff. It's a sad, desperate attempt, but he is gonna be rewarded. I mean, let's just be frank. People love the criminals. The criminals fail upwards. We succeed downwards. We get punished for our success with the censorship, the demonetization, the, uh, of course, the rigging of fun things in life, et cetera. The most fair and free election that ever happened that we love, that, you know, we, we have so many things, but they, they fake hate crime. You get a Yale, uh, you know, you end up teaching at Yale. You end up getting a movie role. You get a music career. And then nobody buys it, but you get paid anyways. And that's what it is. You get rewarded for evil. Mm -hmm. But we're fighting for good. So our reward is not here on earth. Our reward is in heaven. And unfortunately, so is his punishment. Mm -hmm. Last thoughts. I'll kick it to you. Honestly, I'm here for this. Yeah. I, well, I knew. I saw you bought in your house. He downloaded Absolutely. it. He yeah. was blushing with Lizzo on the screen. He was lying. You have to. Well, I, I just, I love black people. But you just really have to appreciate the audacity of it. Because, like, normally what liars will do is they'll take the claim and they'll sort of try to chip away at it by, act, you know, adding context. And, well, you don't know this detail. He, like, literally just pulled the case details and just said, that didn't happen. Right. <laughs> like, everything you know happened, you're wrong. Right. And if you disagree, it's because you're actually trying to kill me. No, <laughs> and I know he is. He really is an example of the mental illness that we've been talking about this entire episode. Mental illness coming to a town near you. You guys, we are out of time. Don't forget to follow and keep up with Spencer, Elijah, and John. See, just the first names on social media. Up next, I will be speaking with Tim Pool. So stick around. Mm -hmm.